Bless, God bless. Welcome, 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 everybody. Uh, it is such a great blessing to be back uh, here with you all through our virtual worship. Um, certainly, uh, the last few months have been so tumultuous, and uh, we are uh, indeed grateful for the faithfulness of God. And, uh, so for the next two Sundays, I uh, intend to preach to us during the highest holy days of our tradition, uh, this on Palm Sunday, the penultimate Sunday before uh, we celebrate uh, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, in the liturgical calendar of uh, the Christian church. Let us then turn our attention to Luke chapter number 19, where we will spend uh, these few moments uh, recounting this very important and powerful uh, procession of Jesus the Christ uh, reaching uh, literally the, the purpose for which he came um, to demonstrate uh, through the power of his life and his love, uh, the redemptive, the depths to which the redemptive power of God would be unleashed among us. Uh, Luke is uh, one of the most uh, important recollections of the gospel, uh, the good news, the life, and the teachings of Jesus. Uh, and we find the book of Luke to capture uh, the procession, the grand entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Uh, Luke chapter number 19, verse 28. Uh, hear now the words of the scriptures as we have them. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and uh, found it as Jesus had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. And then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus up on it. And as Jesus rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And as he was now approaching the path down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had been seeing, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And verse number 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Oh my. Now, let, let's keep reading because I, I got uh, uh, this. these verses uh, I think will be a great context for uh, the, the way in which I hope for us to approach this message uh, during this season. So Jesus came near, saw the great city, talking about Jerusalem, and he wept over it, saying, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you up on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. This is the word of the Lord from us, for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to take these verses and spend the next few moments uh, on this Palm Sunday speaking from the topic, waiting for the world to change. Come on, just put that in the chat. I'm waiting 
for the world to change. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please allow your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. May all of God's people say amen. Waiting on the world to change if it is indeed the case that the world must change. The world is changing, and we are indeed witnessing the change. I want to commission to you this morning that there is a change that is upon us, and for many of us, this change uh, is so disruptive, and it has literally unraveled uh, that which we have deemed to be normal and we have taken for granted. I was uh, riding in with uh, my daughters, and we were just talking about all the things in the last year, uh, pre-COVID, that we some year, a year later, take for granted that we wish we could have back. This idea that we are still living with a semblance of quarantine and disruption and social distancing, all the while we are seeing perhaps the light at the end of the tunnel. If you're like me, we are still waiting for the world to change, perhaps in our favor. It is not very different from many of the uh, original uh, receivers of this text, those who were of Jewish descent, those who were God-fearers, uh, quote-unquote Gentiles, who believed the message and the, 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 the tradition that was revealed through uh, Abraham and Joseph and Jacob and Moses, and, and just this idea that there are always those waiting for the world, their world, the world, to change. And surely there are reasons that compel us, that remind us that the world must change. Uh, the mass shootings that have literally uh, gripped our country's attention once again, uh, the ways in which the anti-Asian uh, vitriol has continued to metastasize and cause such uh, discontent uh, and dis. Uh, heartening uh, feelings among our Asian loved ones and we who are always horrified by these uh, scurrilous attacks upon the vulnerable. Uh, just this week, we've seen uh, the unleashing of another attack on voting rights. After all that we did to change uh, this country from an authoritarian regime, we are still seeing the authoritarian sensibilities uh, trying to snatch power from the people. We have anti-black racism and misogyny and homophobia, transphobia, all still at work among us and still dealing with the literal death and or sickness that has resulted from coronavirus. Yes, we're waiting on the world to change. We're waiting on the world to be set right again. And I could say to all of us that many of us are waiting for our own worlds to change. Our families, our relationships, our marriages, our children, our health, our vocation, our business, uh, our educational journey. <clears throat> Those things that are of dearest concern, uh, they may be in a moment of stagnation. And I want you to know that we are a people as we march towards Easter Resurrection Sunday, who for thousands of years have had to stand on the precipice of another declaration and affirmation that death does not have the final say, and yet be reminded that death is at work, despair is at work, and the world must change, and we are caught between the change we seek and the reality we must face. I want you to know, child of God, that we are never a people who are experiencing this tension for the first time. 
The question for us then is, as we wait for the world to change, as we wait for the promise of God to be revealed, even as we wait for the arrival of Jesus' power demonstrated through resurrection and healing and wholeness, Oh, my question to you and I, dare I say, in these moments is, how will we wait? As we wait for the world to change, how will we wait? And this is a very important message I believe the scriptures are declaring to us because uh, it is indeed a choice that we wrestle with every day. There were times where uh, how we waited was different, you know. Uh, uh, if 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 I was waiting for uh, the 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 uh, revelation of uh, uh, my favorite sports team's victory, uh, it would feel different if I knew the result. But during those moments and times when the results seem to elude me where I can't literally predict what is going to happen, I can often be filled with both excitement and anxiety at the same time. I can be filled with uh, both, both, both uh, a sense of foreboding, but also a sense of celebration. Because what I do not know for sure creates space for that which has often created such trauma and such challenge by being let down before. I don't know if you've ever been let down before while you were waiting. Praise God. I don't know if you ever uh, thought a ride was going to come and, and while you were waiting, you got the call that they changed their plans. I don't know if you've ever uh, waited for that money to be paid back to you, uh, but then you got the call that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Brother Mike, I've fallen on hard times myself. I, I don't know if you've ever been in a doctor room or been for an interview and, 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 and you had your hopes high and they got dashed to the ground. And in the course of waiting, it creates such trauma and such challenge for you that while you wait for the next time or the next opportunity, rather than anticipation, you have lots of foreboding. Well, I do believe this is part and parcel of what the children of Israel, the followers of Jesus in this text, have been waiting for quite some time for a redeemer, for a liberator, for a political revolution. And they see Jesus spending these years uh, going to those who were most vulnerable, living on the margins, willfully throwing in his lot with those who others had cast away. And they begin to see the power of Jesus at work that they had never seen before. And I'm sure a part of them were asking continuously, could this be the one? And as they were waiting on their world to change, Jesus asked them to do several things. And, and, and I want to lift these things up to you and I. Why? Because how we wait, how we wait with despair or hope will greatly determine the quality of our waiting season. If we wait with bitterness versus gentleness, it will greatly inform the quality of our waiting season. If you and I wait with possibility versus scarcity, it will greatly influence the posture of how we wait. Because when you are overwhelmed with despair, even when hope arrives, you may not be able to recognize it. Lord, help me. If you wait with bitterness rather than gentleness, when your answer arrives, your response may be too harsh, even when you've gotten what you have been waiting for. If you wait with scarcity versus possibility, you may arrive to that which you have hoped for with your fist still shut, 
not with your heart and your mind open to the new. So the question I want you and I to think about is while we wait for the world to change, while we wait for resurrection to literally break into our lives, how will we wait? Well, the biblical text gives us several clues that I think uh, real quickly I can offer to us that may be instructive. Jesus, again, engaging with his disciples, disciples who had been with Jesus through the highs and the lows, the vicissitudes of his ministry, the times when he was being celebrated and the times when he was being ran out of town. They've all been there, and, and it is, I think, the first test of how we wait. Will we be available? I want you to tell yourself that I will wait with availability. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I'll wait with availability. Verse number 30. You see Jesus giving his disciples instructions, telling them that you will find a colt, a donkey tied there, untie it and bring it to me. It is important for you and I to appreciate that Jesus uh, literally uh, put his disciples into a posture of not just their own availability, but going to find the availability of others, to test the availability of others. The significance of this donkey, of this cult, cannot be lost upon us. Why? Because while they were waiting, while they were being available, they were still being taught lessons along the way. Oh, come on. Somebody ought to just say that while I wait, I'm willing to learn. Mm -hmm. God, what will you teach me while I'm waiting? They are looking for a political leader. Jesus says, don't go find me a horse and a chariot. Go find me a donkey and a colt. Mm -hmm. Why? Because in in ancient world uh, 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 symbolism, if you will, Donkeys were used for ceremonial purposes, uh, whereas horses were used for symbols of war. Donkeys were used as symbols of peace and, and to literally enact a treaty and negotiation. And, and, and I hear Jesus saying to them that while you wait, child of God, be open to the ways I may change your mind while you're waiting. Oh, is anybody open for a change of mind while you wait for the world to change? You think that the change that needs to happen is external. But I have found often that the change God seeks to make in us is internal. And if you and I can have an open mind while we wait, we can be available to God's activity while we wait. We could literally show up in this season, not with the, the symbols of war and conflict and hatred and malice and violence and retribution, but we can literally show up in this season with our availability being characterized by peacemaking and restoration and love. I, I love the words of uh, Reverend Milton Brunson and the, the Thompson community singers. They had a song back in the day, and I'm going to read these lyrics for you because they say it much more profoundly and clear than I ever could. Uh, the song is called, Lord, I'm available to you. Listen to the words. Uh, the words simply say, you gave me my hands to reach out to man, to show them your love and your perfect plan. You gave me my ears. I can hear your voice so clear. I can hear the cries of sinners, but can I wipe away their tears? You gave me my voice to speak your word, to sing all your praises to those who never heard. But with my eyes, I see a need for more availability. I see hearts that have been broken. So many people to be free. The chorus goes on to say, Lord, I'm available to you. My will I give to you. I'll do what you say do. Use me, Lord, to show someone the way and enable me to say my storage is empty. Oh, while I wait, God, let me drop off some things 
that keep me from being available to you. God, use my ears, my hands, my voice, my eyes, all the tools that you've given me, I give them back to you. So you can use them as you please. I have emptied out my cup so that you can fill it up. Now I'm free and I just want to be more available to you. Listen, child of God, it has never been God's pattern of engagement to transform the worst conditions of our existence without the active participation of that which God has created. That literally God's work is always incarnational. It's always in partnership with that which God has created. And while God loves partnership, it need not be abusive nor violating. But God's partnerships, God's partnerships arrive from or emerge from a sacred mutuality that exponentially produces life and possibility. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that while we wait, can we wait with the kind of availability that demonstrates we are God's arms and legs in the world and within our own lives? So. What has you tied up like the colt in need of someone to come and set you free? What are the things in your life, in the life of your family, that needs liberation and needs freedom? How can we untie ourselves from those things that keep us from being available to God while we're waiting for the world to change. Come on, just pat yourself on the chest and say, God, I must be available while I wait. Yes, the second thing that I believe the scriptures lift up, that you and I must uh, wait for the world to change, listen to this, without obstruction. Yes, without obstruction, without you and I putting barriers in the way. It's one thing to be available, but you and I must make sure as we are available, we are available without obstruction. Verse number 39 says that some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke them. And I find the Pharisees both as a literal description or expression of those folk in our lives who are often not tuned in to what God is doing, to be uh, uh, indicative of ways we show up in the world. But I also believe that Pharisees can be symbolic in the ways in which we create obstruction to how we wait. I want you to ask yourself, as I wait for the world to change, will my own unbelief, will my own lust for power and control cause me to miss out on the inevitability of the change God is doing right in front of me. Lord, have mercy. Uh, the, the Gospels always refer to these kind of uh, uh, enemies or adversaries of Jesus, uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the uh, Herod Herodians, if you will. Uh, these Pharisees and Sadducees and the Her Herodians, they were legal scholars who were committed to the Mosaic laws and authority. Those were the Pharisees. Then you had the Sadducees who were more religious leaning and committed to the priestly authority. Then you had the Herodians who were the premier political party, seeking political independence with a priority of a leader from the lineage of Herod. So think about this. You have, uh, while you're waiting, the influences of the most learned among us, our legal scholars, our intellectual scholars, those that are so learned that they have mastered, if you will, uh, the, the, the art of knowledge and, and information. You had the Sadducees, those who were more religious in their orientation, but yet still had power to determine the, the value and the, the, the course of so many people's lives and self-worth. 
And then you had the Herodians, the, the politicians. So, so you, you, you got the academics and the law, lawyers. You got the, the religious leaders and you got the politicians. All of these individuals represent a certain kind of obstruction that they are not fully aware of themselves. Why? Because all that they have garnered through the course of their life have literally blinded them to the ways in which God may show up. Now, hear me clear. I am not a hater, as it per, as it was uh, would 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 uh, as some would say of uh, you being a learned person. Because I got my degree. Somebody say, man, I want you to go get yours. I'm not one of these folks who are anti-church and, and anti-faith uh, leaders and pastors and clerics because there is a significant uh, responsibility placed upon too, so many of us to help shape and disciple people away from racism and hierarchies and violence. I'm not against the politicians of the, the, the day. Why? Because we need folks who can steward our democracies and our countries in the right direction. But you and I must make sure that no matter what label falls upon us, we do not become an obstruction to the arrival of God. God in our lives and in the world. How many of you know that with all of the wisdom you have, God can still surprise you? Lord, I wish I had somebody that was willing to be surprised today. Amen. I know I, I've read every book there is and, and I can predict so much of what can happen based off of the histories that have come before me, knowing that there's nothing new under the sun. But how many of you know morning by morning there are some new mercies I can find? That there are moments where God can still surprise me. God can show up and surprise us in ways that we did not expect respect and all of the learning and all the expertise and and all of the talents and the skills can often be not uh, commensurate with the ways in which God will seek to surprise you. Child of God, while you wait, don't become an obstruction to God's divine surprise, but be open to it. God, I'm willing to be surprised. I'm not going to be one of these folk like the Pharisees who are telling you and those who are with you to quiet down because it is interrupting my understanding of your divine movement. No, I'm going to be I'm going to be open to your surprise. I'm going to be open to the way the Holy Spirit blows like the wind. How, how many of you know when you get a gust of wind and you don't know where it came from and you start turning around, you're trying to figure out uh, who, where, where's that wind? I want God to blow on me and my life in that way where I'm surprised. God, how, where, when uh, is this possible? Yes, why? Because while I'm waiting, I'm waiting with an with a anticipation. And that's the last thing I want you to appreciate, child of God. As in verse number 37, the scripture says that when Jesus came near, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully praising God. I want you to know that I don't need Jesus to uh, be all the way up on me before I start anticipating with a joyful and a glad heart of what God is getting ready to do. I know that we're still going through trials and tribulations. I know that we're still going through seasons of loss, grief, and death. But I want you to know that the, the gift of this passage for some of us today is that while they were waiting for the world to to change they saw Jesus coming near and just Jesus approaching them created anticipation it created a, a, a posture where they could reflect over the miracles that Jesus had done before and they realized that if Jesus had did it before Jesus could do it again. And their response in anticipation was not to be overwhelmed by the grief or the, 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 the death threats that were still happening around them. But they said, I will eschew despair. In this moment when Jesus shows up so concretely, I will throw away my sense of hopelessness. And I'm going to take a time out and say, you know, with, with praise and thanksgiving, I'm going to offer to God as a discipline, as a down 
payment as a reminder that God will arrive every time. Do I have a witness in here that can say God will arrive, God will show up, that the procession that is happening on the way to Calvary is a preview of the victory that will happen post-resurrection uh, that God is telling some of you right now in the words uh, of the great Walter Hawkins, don't wait till the battle is over. But you ought to lift up your voice right now and shout. I'm going to shout. I'm going to lay down my garments like they did in this text. And I'm going to lay down my burdens and my trials. I'm going to take a few moments and I'm going to trust that God, if I give my garments as a pathway for your entrance, that while you proceed and while you make way, that I may not have to pick up these, these garments. Garments uh, of despair, these garments uh, of sadness, these garments uh, of perpetual grief. But God, you have a way of wiping every tear from my eyes. Uh, you have a way of awakening inside of us uh, that special, unique praise that only you can uh, get out of us. Uh, how many of you know I can cheer for the 49ers? Uh, uh, I'm glad that they made that blockbuster trade. Uh, uh, I I can cheer for the Warriors or the Lakers or whoever we like today. Yeah, I can cheer for my favorite boo and my favorite this and my favorite that. But does anybody have uh, that special praise uh, that you only reserve for the King of Kings? Uh, and the Lord of Lords. Uh, anybody have that special praise uh, that only can be evoked uh, when you see your creator, your redeemer, your sustainer riding into your life? Uh, uh, you'll throw up your hands like they did in the text and say, Hosanna! Hosanna, blessed be the rock. Blessed be you who come in the name of the Lord. While I wait, I'm going to wait with anticipation. It won't erase every problem. It won't erase every negative feeling. It won't erase, erase every human frailty and weakness I have. But if I can wait with anticipation, then I believe that while I wait, I can still give God some praise. I can still serve with a generous heart. I can still show up to forgive those who do me wrong. I can continue to look for the surprise of God. Why? Because while I'm waiting, I know that if I shut up my mouth, uh, Jesus said the stones would cry out. And if you like me, I'm never going to allow no rock to take my I praise because the rocks don't got the story I got. Do I got some testimonies up in this virtual service today? A testimony of what God did. A testimony of how God brought you out. If God did it before, then child of God, wait with anticipation. While you wait, believe that the world is changing and we are are a part of that change. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. I'm waiting for the world to change. And while I wait, God, I will wait with availability. I'm going to wait without obstruction. And I am going to wait in anticipation. For the world must change when God literally undoes the power of death and destruction. So, child of God, let us wait. As we enter this holy week, this week of literal struggle and persecution, we are aligning ourselves with the journey of Jesus to Calvary. Good Friday will arrive, and for many of us, both in a symbolic way, but also in a concrete way, we are living in a Good Friday era. 
where trouble seems to be around us. It is ubiquitous in its presence. Where death seems to be ever present. But remind yourself while we wait for resurrection, oh, that God's resurrecting power has never left. The same Jesus that raised the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, it is waiting for us on the other side of Good Friday. So while we wait, we wait with God's peace and power. Come on, take a few moments and just invite the spirit of the Lord to give you that which you need while you wait. God, I need more of your peace. I need more of your joy. I need more of your strength. I need more of your power. So while I wait, what garments must I throw down as an act of praise and worship while Jesus makes his grand entrance into my life and into my circumstance? While I wait, what is in my past? What pain or crisis clouds my judgment or vision and causes me to show up obstructing God's arrival rather than joining in the work that hastens his arrival? While I wait, what keeps me tied up so I'm not available? What in my life needs freedom and liberation so I can be available while I wait? I pray, God, for salvation, for healing, for strength. For those who hear these words this morning, we are aware, we're cognizant that Good Friday for many of us has been a struggle, a season of struggle. For a year, we've been enduring the vicissitudes, the challenges, the, the, the enigmas of life. But while we wait for the world to change, we will not throw in the towel. We will not turn our backs on you or those whom you've called us to love. But through the power of your spirit, we will wait for the world to change. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you, people of the way. We love you with the love of the Lord.